for this morning's first Catalyzing Change ses session on innovation, please welcome Andrew Zoli, the Chief Impact Officer of Planet, and his panelists. How are you all this morning? Thank you, Sundrine, for those remarks. Before we welcome up our panelists, I just want to say a couple of quick things. First of all, just by quick introduction, I'm Andrew Zali. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at an organization called Planet. We are incredibly proud to be partners with Peter and the team at ASU and all of you who are here collected uh, in, the, in the room. As you may know, we operate a large constellation of satellites. We continually observe the Earth every day in high resolution. We'll say more about some of that. You'll you imagine hear a little bit about that in our discussion this morning. But what I really wanted to, to do is to kind of bridge from what we just heard from Sandrine to the discussion we're going to have this morning. What you heard from Sandrine was, was a kind of um, two fundamental core truths of the moment. The first one, did you all hear those bumps or was that just in my head? I think that went in my head. Okay, the, the, the first one is that all of our human systems, all of human civilization, including and especially the market, is a subset of the foundational systems that make flourishing on the earth possible. Right? We, the, the economy and society are a subset of nature and not the other way around. And the second thing we heard, if you listened at, it's sort of at the abstract pattern of what we heard from Sandrine, is that these systems seem like they're out of control and on a collision course, right? That is to say, a system without brakes, a system that is locked in a kind of fundamental narrative of growth, a fundamental narrative of um, uh, growth that's not aligned to planetary and physical uh, fundamentals and realities. And so in a system that's locked in, the definition of innovation is about the creation of a space for creative possibility. It's a space of loosening those fundamental strong ties and creating a kind of liquid space where more creative possibility can occur, where we introduce concepts of agency, we introduce new fundamental narratives, we introduce new verbs into our systems. And the discussion we're gonna have this morning with this extraordinary group of, of panelists is all about that. It's about how do we enlarge the space of creative possibility and creative imagination? How do we think about the systems conditions associated with, uh, with creating cultures of innovation? Because the 10 must-haves and must-dos are vast in their scope. We could have committed all week to any one of them drilling down in specificity. So here, the goal is not to unpack one and say, here are the three innovative things we have to do, but rather, what can we learn from people who are, who are experienced practitioners of innovation about how we uh, loosen the throttle and loosen the, the struggle and the, str uh, the, the kind of uh, strangulation that many of these systems hold today and create the possibility for, for creative alternatives. So this morning, uh, we're going to have uh, four really wonderful esteemed colleagues. One, I'll just start right off the bat, Alex Deegan, the, the, the founder of, of um, Conservation X Labs. Would you like to come on up? I'm going to have you. All right. uh, Alex, a core member of this community, a core thinker about uh, this kind of work. Uh, and, and a long-standing practitioner. Gavin McCormick uh, from, um, from Climate Trace, an organization you, you'll hear a lot more about making, uh, making uh, uh, climate emissions visible in a foundational way. Uh, Robbie Shingler, the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Planet, my home institution, uh, who's doing a ton of work thinking about regenerative economics. And uh, uh, Leia Lizarondo, who is from uh, food, uh, uh, food Rescue Hero, who's doing all kinds of work on making food systems more efficient, uh, making them, uh, b building circularity into our, into our system. And so every one of these folks, we could dedicate a session to their work and we're gonna try and create a conversation between them and a conversation with you. Um, and so I, I wanna just have you uh, first, colleagues, just say, share a little bit. Do you have a mic? Okay, good. Um, 
just a little bit about the work that you do. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, when I think about systems innovation, I think about kind of almost like a kind of physical language of innovation, like the introduction of verbs and gestures and in, in part of the kind of syntax of how we think about innovation in the system. And each one of you represent a different piece of that. So I'm going to start with Gavin, actually, if you don't mind. Gavin's work at Climate Trace really is about uh, sort of a foundational aspect of innovation in complex systems. And that's about making the invisible visible. Because something we like to say at Planet, and you, know, you can't fix what you can't see. You can't manage what you can't measure. And many of the dynamics of these systems are simply invisible, or they're so large and abstract that they feel like they're outside the scope of normal human cognition. But you know, you've been working to bring those vast abstractions uh, into human, the, sort of the domain of human consciousness. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that work? Sure. So um, I sort of essentially do two things. First, I'm a member of the Climate Trace Coalition. I'm the electricity lead of a group of about 100 collaborating nonprofits, universities, and scientists who are all using artificial intelligence, uh, using planet data and other sources, to look from space at who is causing climate change. So we already know how many emissions are in the atmosphere, but the names and contact information of the owners and operators of every facility causing emissions worldwide have not previously been revealed. And so we are about to announce at COP28, moving from a project of about 70,000 to about 70 million of largest sources of emissions worldwide. I actually prepared a slide wow. just to give you a sense. Yeah. Can we pull that slide up if it's, uh, if it's available? So um, last year, our collaboration was able to give a sense. Uh, so the, this second slide is giving you a sense of the detailed information you get. But basically, we have a map of the world. We have many collaborating scientists uh, able to use artificial intelligence satellite imagery to see from space who is causing those emissions. And we've been able, using trade journals and other machine learning, to get a sense of the names and uh, ownership information of all these facilities. So from power plants and steel mills to um, forests burning down, we're basically trying to trace um, who would actually have to do something to reduce emissions. And the other half of our data is a little more positive. Instead of just pointing fingers at polluters, figuring out now that we have more detailed information about what's causing climate change, are there better solutions than we already knew about to solve it? So just to give you one example of something data like this is unlocking, um, we've said before that we must triple renewable energy. I would actually now question that hypothesis. We now have data that says that one solar panel can vary dramatically in the emissions impact it causes based on where it's built. If you build it in South Africa, where it's going to knock out one of the world's dirtiest coal plants, it will not cause nearly as much reduction in fossil fuel consumption as if you build it in California, where it will replace considerably less dirty power plants. We now know, through data like this, that if we were to invest more heavily in renewable energy in developing countries, where particularly the fossil fuel emissions that are marginal are dirtiest, the same amount of renewable energy could reduce fossil fuels a lot faster. So we're hoping data like this will unlock uh, more positive solutions. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> Leah, tell us a little bit about your work on uh, creating a DoorDash for, um, for food waste. Yeah. So many of us here know that food waste is one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions. And I think, you know, while what we do is extremely functional, so we connect sources of food surplus to those who need it, and have a network of volunteer drivers. So you can imagine you've seen this model everywhere. What I really value about it is that it is, you know, the reason for being, truly, is we talk about all of these things that we must do, must have, all of the numbers on climate. But for the person walking down the street, you know, not even noticing the Javits Center, cognitively, it's really hard to grasp. But when we ask them to create single, simple actions, such as fill, filling their car with food that would have been thrown in the garbage, and then letting them know that cumulatively their actions you know, s removed one car from the road for a year, then cognitively they can understand you know, that these actions can make an impact. And that's really kind of the gateway for every man on the street you know, to take 
action to really notice and to remove the sense of despair that they have for this big, big problem that we have, you know, that is climate. And I think a lot of times, you know, we're all scared to deal with messy human behaviors. But for all the work that we were doing with, you know, big technology, if we don't try to change people's minds, none of this will go beyond what's academic. So that's really the magic of what and, we do. And tell us a little bit more about how many, I think it's, is it in 75 cities now? So the it's, goal is to be in 100 cities yeah. by 2030. We're currently in about 25 cities. And when I started working with Amanda four years ago, we were in five. And um, I think our drivers have now completed over half a million trips. And tell us a little bit more about how it works. Like what just. Get, like bring it to life for us. Yeah, in a sense so it's, a, it's technology that's essentially what a DoorDash driver sees. You see where the food is coming from and where it's going, and you turn on the app, and if you have free time, even today, you can take food from one location to the other. And it could be two meals, it could be a carload of groceries from Whole Foods, which is, happens, unfortunately, too often. Um, and then you take it to an NGO. So in that sense, you know, when we talk about the must-haves, you know, this, this one network model you know, looks at just economies, it looks at equitable access to our resources because you know, it, it equalizes and tries to bridge this disconnect between surplus and need. And then finally, it's, it's all about healthy food because 60% of what we waste are fruits and vegetables, which is not available to people who are experiencing poverty. Um, let, I want to come back to that and, and draw a through line through some of your work, but let me turn to Alex for a minute. You know, you mentioned the kind of fear of the messy human in the middle, and I think of Alex as you, you as a sort of master orchestrator of uh, human ca capability and platform and incentive to kind of unlock these larger creative spaces. And I, I, I think it'd be great for everyone to hear a little bit about how those three pieces fit together in your work. Yeah, so my co-founder, Paul Bungie, who's here, uh, and I, Paul was at XPRIZE. I was chief scientist at USAID and building a DARPA for development. And um, we realized that innovation was actually something that we critically needed for conservation, that the problems were increasing exponentially, but our solutions were linear. And we also had this problem that 43 years ago, right, conservation was established 53 years since the first Earth Day. We have defined the problems, but we really weren't generating the solutions. And so what we, and to do that recognizes that, that we needed more than conservationists. We needed whole new disciplines involved in conservation. So we set up CXL to be able to do that. And in particular, we tried to do it you know, in a couple of different ways. One is we use prizes and challenges. Paul being at XPRIZE, I set up the Grand Challenges for Development Program with Gates. How do we use these to actually bring in innovations, recognizing talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And the second is we build tools that are democratized technology that are accessible to anyone that allows us to go to the front lines of where technology is needed. So through things like the prizes and challenges, we've been able to support 141 innovators in 69 countries across six continents uh, that are building tools to fight extinction and help them raise over $300 million and plus uh, to bring those solutions to scale, all non-dilutive. And then through our own innovation, we've been taking existing tools that conservation use, camera traps, and how do we actually take them from passive devices into real-time devices that locally allow us to identify poachers with guns, uh, species of interest, behaviors, or even disease, uh, and get that information in real time. The other device we built was uh, a handheld molecular lab. Uh, and we built it originally for fish traceability, right? 90, you know, if you think about 30% of your seafood, it's not what they say it is. If you order red snapper anywhere in New York, Nine times out of 10, you're not getting red snapper. And 86% of the time, the substitute, red snapper, by the way, is 12 different species according to the F FDA. So nine times out of 10, you're not getting one of the 12. But 86% of the time, it's coming from a less well-managed fishery. So we started working on fish traceability, timber trafficking, uh, uh, wildlife trafficking. COVID came along in March 2020. 
and we decided we wanted to help out with that and got into the the diagnostics component of Operation Warp Speed, uh, and that just accelerated us to build a device that we're now using for pests and pathogen detection, for human health, for animal health, and the larger framing of planetary health. And I think the coolest aspect of what we've been doing on this is we can't build every assay. And there's this problem of all these neglected diseases, so we've built an app store equivalent through what we call a molecular development kit, which is the equivalent of a software development kit, to allow people around the world to build assays for our device. And we just had the first third-party built assay tested in a field in North Carolina to address the potato blight that caused the Irish famine. So we were really excited about that. So, fantastic, uh, uh, wonderful work. But I, I want to come to this question about, so, you know, you've been doing, you and your, and Paul, you've all been doing this work for a long time. And, you know, I, I think what's interesting is the mix of, like, there's a physical platform sitting in your lap, that, that, uh, that device. And, and but, there's, but there's all this social orchestration around it, right? How do you, like, how do you pick one of those challenges? How do you, how do you decide what becomes hardware and what becomes, you know, kind of the social software? if you will, like the kind of the, the social process that leads to those kinds of outcomes? So our mission is to prevent the sixth mass extinction, and we may be in the middle of one. So we're thinking about the underlying drivers of extinction. Just last week, thanks for the setup, uh, we held something um, uh, called a Big Think. Uh, Rodrigo was there with us, which was fantastic. Uh, but the purpose was uh, to help us build a drawdown for extinction. Uh, and John Foley is literally in the next room over talking about Project Drawdown, and we were deeply inspired by that. But, and it was this idea that, you know, again, we have focused on hotspots, landscapes, and ecoregions, and all these places and species that we needed to rank. This is what conservation's work has really focused on. But we haven't ranked the solutions, just like you were talking about what power plants to actually get to. We haven't ranked the solutions in terms of how they will have an impact on extinction. It's a much more difficult calculus than, than gigatons of CO2 removed, but doing that allows us to, at least for ourselves, say, are we making the biggest impact of the dollars that we have? And could we influence how other people are thinking about the solutions? Do you have a sense of, of like, is there a, a, you know, you invest a dollar here, you get $5 of value over there, kind of, is there, is an, is there an equation like that? I mean, we, 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 put in, uh, we put in essentially what are pre-seed grants into all these companies, and we do see them as investments. If these things aren't getting the scale, there's no reason for us to really be involved in it. You, can, you know, when I was at USAID, we built incredible tech that went nowhere, right? USAID has spent, it's been around, John F. Kennedy set it up along with Peace Corps and NASA at the same time, and it, you know, it's been around for 50 plus, 55 maybe years now, and uh, we've spent over a trillion dollars. And there's probably 20 things that have gotten the scale, right? With, with over a trillion dollars in 50 years. That's a terrible record, I hate to say, right? And if we're not focused on scale, and, it, and I think it's probably true of all the global development agencies, then we're not being successful in what we're trying to do. It's interesting, you know, uh, Silicon Valley in some ways uh, makes those kinds of investments, right? They, they're, um, if, you, if you were a VC and invested $20 trillion and got 20 scale returns, you probably wouldn't be a VC for very long. So I appreciate that. It's also true that sometimes what that ends up doing is leading to a preponderance of dating apps for cats and other kind of useless pits of crap, right? That, that you say, well, does this actually, is this actually additive? to the human experience. I mean, it's clearly additive to the cat experience on some level, but that's a separate story. But, but what's interesting to me is, is that um, here with us this morning, we have someone who has led something from the garage to something that delivers at planetary scale, has scaled all the way up through that, through that journey, and that's Robbie, uh, the co-founder of Planet and, uh, and our chief strategy officer. And I'd love to ask you, Robbie, before we pivot to, to some other thinking about regenerative, like how, how the regenerative economics work, I'm gonna ask you about in a minute. 
is just to talk about that journey, like the connection between the founding instinct of Planet and the kind of structure that we've taken on as an organization, and you know, sort of how how does all that fit together for you as a, as the founder? Sure. Yeah. Th thanks, Andrew. And um, I think the the things that I've learned over the last 12 years since we started the company is that it really isn't so much about the technology. Um, I I've been fortunate enough to, um, you know, grow up and I'm a child of the modern world, right? I'm American, I was a physicist, still am a physicist, um, and learned about the world in its little constituent pieces. Um, and um, good systems thinking and good engineering approaches. Uh, but that does come with a particular worldview, one that is a little bit more reductionist, one that is um, solving a problem. Uh, rather than uh, in reality, um, everything is, is more connected than that, and you can only respond, um, and it is an infinite game. Um, but starting from that perspective, we, we changed the economics of space, um, and we did that in order to do a mission to scan the whole world every day. And um, fortunately, always, well, w one thing you didn't necessarily ask is, but if you're ever doing a huge, ambitious project, do it with people that you love. Um, they influence you, uh, you influence them, um, and, and it shows. It shows in, in, in um, how you show up every day, uh, and then also what the effect is of, of your, your time together. Um, so we had a lot of deep intention around this, um, and so much so that the industry that we're in space is really all about governments. Uh, it's really all about big, huge science missions or big, secret national security missions. Uh, and we wanted to do something that was more for humanity, more for the planet. Uh, so uh, over the years, I've learned a lot about more of the social technologies than the hard technologies. Um, and, um, and that kind of veil of ignorance was lifted. Um, and, and that's really the, the, the poly crisis that we're in today is more of our, our coordination challenges. Um, and um, thankfully, uh, they are all human invented, right? There are ways in which, uh, and there are pockets of innovation all over the world that's happening, um, that, that you can take some of those solutions for whatever you're building so that you can do it with intention. Uh, so one of the things that, that uh, I've learned a lot over the last few years is around corporate form, right, around law. Um, we, we chose to, to go public as a company right in the middle of, you know, this economy and, you know, the underlying infrastructure of a, a linear-based extractive materials and petrochemical economy. Um, but we did it as a public benefit corporation so that um, I, as a board member, am liable to shareholders and my stakeholders. And thank you. And, and who are those stakeholders? Uh, this, who are the stakeholders? I can go through all of them, um, but it, it really is, um, it's, encap it's encapsulated in, in our mission, in our statement, um, that is in our bylaws, which is to accelerate humanity toward a more sustainable, secure, and prosperous world. And in, um, as, as you can see what Gavin's doing here, this is super useful for sustainability and for enforcement, which is security. And um, if we are to have a prosperous world or if we are to use social technologies to change the rules of the game around how humans interact with one another and get toward more of a circular or regenerative economy, we need really good laws. We need really good enforcement. We really need good security. Um, and also to bring nature um, into um, the lexicon, uh, into the, the balance sheet of organizations, uh, whether you're, you are a family, or a community, country, or a company. Um, and so that's, that's what um, I feel is, is, is awesome in, and hopeful, because it's true we are fucked, but like hopeful is uh, we need to change a little bit of... That, that, of there's a t-shirt slogan right there yeah. for us all. <laughs> Uh, but I, I believe what we need is we, we need a new dream for the modern world. We need to know what we're moving toward. 
Uh, most of the activities that, that are happening this week is really all about triage. You know, it's not fundamentally changing um, the logics of, of how we interact, how we see um, nature, how we see ourselves as part of nature. I mean, it, it's a bit of a consciousness shift, a new dream that, uh, that you know, all of us need to, um, A, remember who we are, um, but then B, actually be in right relation with one another as well as with, with um, nature uh, around us. Um, and, you know, if you unpack all of that, that's why I'm super passionate about trying to move us toward a more true cost economy or a more regenerative economy. And that leads to more resilient uh, local communities um, and allow for us to, to kind of shift off this trajectory because our GDP growth mindset is completely one-to-one -one, um, um, uh, coupled with uh, uh, material use as well as um, oil and and it's it's that curve is not bending you know it, it's uh, amen I, I I I'd like to ask you a little bit I'd like to probe a little bit Robbie because I, I'm gonna circle in some of our other uh, colleagues here the relationship between things that today are considered externalities th and bringing those externalities in Right. In, in fact, actually, all of you work in that space, right? You know, that I'm reminded of this quote by uh, a favorite uh, philosopher, Francesco Varela, who says, say, he's, he's since passed, but when a system is in ill health, one of the surest pathways is to reconnect it more with itself. That is just literally enabling the system to be understood in a more holistic way. And if there's one thing that's true about capitalism is that, uh, you know, ever since uh, the invisible hand of the marketplace, we've, markets have tended to treat nature as hyperabundant, self-replenishing, and free. Um, and we certainly, if that was ever true in Adam Smith's day, it's certainly not true today. Um, and so, you know, I wonder about the, like, is it, the, is it that we want to bring these externalities into the system as it is? Or is it that we want to reinvent the system as it is and have those externalities support the system? Like what, what do you see as a regenerative, like where's your, where's your thinking taking you? Well, I, I do think it's probably worth looking at a, a, a blank slate uh, in case there is some sort of a, a music stops moment. Um, I hate to say that, but it is, it is true. Um, you know, th this current financial system that we're in, the rules of the game was set up after World War II. Um, and if you actually look at the economic history of the United States, there have been four different types of economies. Um, and they all happened after a shock. You know, it happened with um, the Civil War, it happened with well, the founding, the Civil War, um, and then the stock market crash, um, and then World War II. So, like, we tend to think that they're static and they're not, right? So I think it is important to, you know, imagine what, what, would, what would a true cost economy be like, being in right relation, um, so that you can kind of move toward that future and also be prepared in case there's an opportunity for the right stakeholders to be in the room when, when, when new rules are gonna be uh, designed. However, the transition is something that um, I think about of going, you know, moving capital away from climate risk and moving capital toward, or in moving value toward natural capital, um, and then triage. Um, and so, when it comes to internalizing externalities, um, that is um, that's using legislation that we have today, right? Um, if you can measure something, and people have a permit for it, and then they break their permit, they get fined. They get fined, that's an incentive to clean up their act or to maybe do something, change their supply chain somehow. And that's a, just a, an evolution around moving away from climate risk uh, with a fine. Um, and then, of course, we have two other things that government, this, is, by the way, is so much of this is around government. Like, they, they set the rules of the game. They put out the, the incentives for um, changing behavior. Um, and that is either with, um, subsidizing something um, yeah, or actually giving out um, um, concessions. So we have to phase out 
subsidies that we've had in agriculture industry, at least in, uh, for a long time, and exactly our food systems, uh, then, um, and then we should begin to um, fine polluters. So, but like all these systems are right here, and we now have the technology to be able to do it, and it's trusted. Gavin's got a list. Yeah. He knows. No, and then, and, but we know where the forward leaning regulatory bodies are on the planet. California is one of them, Colorado, right? Um, and, and also, with this type of data, even with um, marketing, you can actually see what truly is underneath the economy of say, Norway. I hate, I love Norway. Um, but like we have to be kind of honest around how, where this wealth came from and at what cost. Um, and, and I think with this, the, the, these, um, the poly crisis that we're in is really only going to accelerate. Um, and so it's important, I think, for people to be uh, clear-eyed on what we do know today and also recognizing how quickly um, some of the social technologies can move forward. And, and some innovations I do want to say is like, is in Latin America. Um, what's happening uh, with respect to how frequently those democracies actually redefine themselves. Um, how, how, how often, uh, which, which is not necessarily good, but in some cases there's innovation, right? You can see some of these new uh, constitutions that have come out that actually are more of a plurinational state with a lot of sovereignty that's given to indigenous nations um, and to have land rights for nature. Uh, which essentially allows for nature to be seen as a legal person, which is the vernacular that we talk to within the social technologies. Um, and that is a stakeholder. Um, and so then it, 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 if you give voice to that, uh, you begin to actually see your economic system a little bit differently. And then you can see that as true natural capital. And that is to not you know, financialize, but that is to actually um, design within the system and the rules of the game. And in some cases of these indigenous communities, they don't have dependent the path pathways that we do, reliant on a linear extractive based economy, right? So though that infrastructure layer is ripe, right? Um, so there's quite a bit of, of innovative pockets that are happening all around the world. We do need a good learning community of those. And I think that Global Futures is part of that, uh, to allow for um, more people to be in here, to then learn from one another. And it's more of a South-South activity. Alex, pick up on that. Yeah, you know, one of the, um, I'm an evolutionary biologist, but I'm also a lawyer. And one of the most important things I remember. I love and hate you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But, but law is the fabric of our social contracts, right? It's how we make things work. And that's why I liked it. Didn't like the other lawyers as much, but I like law. The, um, but in property class, I read about this really important, there was this great Supreme Court case called Sierra Club versus Morton. And it just builds on what you said. And it was Justice William Douglas in that case. It was Disney trying to build a ski resort, I think in California. I think it was Snow King, Mineral King uh, was, was, was the mountain. And uh, William Douglas in a separate dissenting opinion said that trees should have standing because this is actually the biggest barrier. You as a taxpayer cannot sue the government for cutting down a national park or a national forest, right? So your idea of, of, of nature as a person, I think is, is, is one that we really need to pursue. Like, how do we actually, how do we allow? Yeah, absolutely. That, and Mount Taranaki is the third one. And the interesting thing about Mount Taranaki is that uh, it can hold assets. So it can get to a point where it can actually own itself. So that, mm. yeah, we can talk more about that. But can I ask a question? Yes, yeah. please. So the, the challenge I have is Trump and Bolsonaro. And, you know, we just lost one of the biggest advocates for nature in Africa, which was President Bongo, right, of Gabon. Gabon was, which is, and we're seeing democracy, the great wave of democracy throughout the world quickly pull back. How do we make these things politi political proof, right? We're seeing the rise of autocracy. We're seeing a lack of faith in government. And I know we have more must-dos on this, 
But these systems have to work no matter who is in power, not just for those who will support us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it comes back to what is that positive future that we're going after yeah. and, um, and remembering who we are. Um, so the, the, the divisiveness that we currently have today is, is, a, is an effect of, of, of many yeah. things, but one of which is that we're, we're actually not um, that connected to place and to one another. Um, and I think a lot of the rise of, at least in, in this country, some of that polarization is because the system, the effect of the system hasn't been mm -hmm. working for them for a couple of generations. And it's isolationist. Um, and we're disconnected. And we don't, we, we want something else than is mm -hmm. there. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it's the right thing. Um, but I think it's part of a broader challenge around like, what is our story? Like, what is this evolution of, of humanity? Well, I think part of what emerges in this part of the story is, is about what you might call translational leadership. That is to say, you know, l let's take, there's a, there's a confluence of things that come together around a challenge. And the one I'm thinking about is around deforestation. So the first challenge is most uh, ministers of environment don't know the current state of all their assets, so they haven't been able to know. Technology comes forward and enables you to see in real time what is the state of the system. And that builds confidence for regulators to create new forms of regulation. There, the EU has just passed comprehensive, what's called the EUDR, the, the European Deforestation Regulation, which says, now that we can see how the system is behaving, we will not allow deforestation-linked commodities to be imported into Europe, and that in turn spurs a market signal. So now there are software companies racing in to saying, how do we create certification systems that can be embedded in the global supply chain so that we know that these, you know, this particular agricultural product was not linked to deforestation? You, you sort of, and, and the challenge there is about orchestrating technology signals and policy signals and commercial signals um, and, you know, so, so it's hard to think about how to do that kind of orchestration and how to pull at, and especially how to communicate across those barriers of difference. I want to circle back to Leia for a second with this in mind and then we'll come this way. But, you know, you're building these systems that are cutting across, right, different dimensions of need and, right? And, and, I want, and you sit as a translational leader kind of between these communities, translating between them. I'm, I'm curious what, first of all, how, are there lessons in your experience around how to do that? How do you, how do you sort of sit in the complicated middle space? And also, what do you need to go from 25 to 100 to 500? Like, what, what if you could get the wind at your back for this, because you're, you're creating, you're, diverting emissions while serving humanity, right? That's an incredible win-win. So how do, we, how do we help scale innovations like the ones that you're leading? So I think one of the things that, you know, we often see is that when we look at technological interventions, one of the first things that we hear is that, and this technology is great because it minimizes human intervention meaning minimizes what we see as error. So I think the courageous thing to do with technology, which we often don't do, is how do we then create technology that actually maximizes human intervention and participation? Because when we look at Trump or Bolsonaro, you know, there's a reason why they're called populist, right? It's because they go down to the core fears of people and then they drive that what if we use it the opposite way what if we don't use technology so that it minimizes human intervention it increases participation and then we go to that core thing which is and this sounds like such a soft word you know but i'm going to go back to what sandrine said this is what we need you know it's a, it's hope and we go to the messy things such as you know, we don't connect just power plants to climate change, we connect gender equality. How messy is that? 
but it's also the most impactful. We connect poverty to climate change. Why is it essential to eliminate poverty? These are all people-based challenges. No satellite, no you know, even app can do that unless we look at everything we do and go back to sense of agency. And that is hard and we have to be brave enough to want that. And can I ask you, I have to say as the moderator, it would have felt weird to clap by myself, so I'm really glad that you guys, um, I think that's beautifully said, Leah. I, 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 wanna, I do wanna ask you to think about, you may not have a perspective on it now, but in, in the sense that innovation is, especially over very complex domains, is intrinsically a team sport. It, it intrinsically involves coalition building and translation of agendas in complex coalitions to, to be able to build the systems. You know, how, how might we help you? I mean, I, I absolutely believe and, and, and concur in the need for trust and hope, which are at the center, you know, and hope emboldens trust and builds trust. And right now the system is absent trust, you know, in, in really significant ways. But we're, I'm very curious about how we, how we help scale your, your efforts. There's a really simple answer to that. And yeah. I'm going to again go back to Sandrine here. How do you help innovations such as this is how you help any innovation, mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you give it funding. Right. And that's really the core need of all of these technologies that are trying to survive. Um, in this world where, you know, the exchange is only to shareholders. Yeah. Um, Gavin, let me come to you, um, maybe to, to you know, you, uh, we've watched very closely this work. You intrinsically are working in coalition. Climate Trace is itself a coalition of actors. Um, very substantially supported by uh, the Nobel laureate and former Vice President Al Gore. Um, you're holding a coalition of, of organizations together. And I, I'm curious, you know, we watched you go from we think we can do this to we can do this for a whole bunch of different sources to apparently 70 million sources. But, but behind that, it sounds like market actors and commercial actors are starting to engage in that signal. Can you tell us a little bit, like, what's happening? What, what's the response to the signal you're producing? Sure, so one thing I could say is, you know, coalitions are hard. <laughs> um, and so I think uh, we had this fear that what would happen is the technology would be built and then that would be it. it I found, to, just to be very frank, it's really easy to get a journalist excited about like, we can point out the bad guys. It's really hard to share news when actually there are fewer bad guys than we thought. One of our findings is that there's been less lying about emissions than was popularly believed. So one of the most significant findings that's been really hard to raise awareness of is that the nations that are members of the Paris Agreement have been inappropriately skeptical of each other. It turns out that the data are more accurate than the various negotiators believed, and that has been a really hard story to raise awareness of. So I think one of the really interesting things I've learned is it's easier to get a coalition around arguing there's a bad guy than arguing something is working. And so one story I'd like to share that um, doesn't get as much press is we have dealt with a very large number of corporations. Many corporations are part of the problem, others are not. It can be really hard to know who's who. And so we've been dealing with a really large number of corporations who are very, very interested. We just had a very successful meeting yesterday. I can't quite name the names yet, but we will soon be announcing a large number of uh, companies that are committing to swap out their supply chains only to buy from companies that we can see from space are producing uh, materials uh, with a low carbon footprint. <laughs> and the suppliers are paying attention. So I hope what we're gonna see is that those companies and those governments who are doing things right, we talk more about that instead of only talking about the ones doing things wrong. And I think we're gonna see a big breakthrough um, to be honest with Cotton. That's a great We are unfortunately at time for this conversation. You could clearly see we could go for a lot longer. There's a lot more of the story to tell, but this is, we hope, a down payment on the conversations we'll be having today and in the breakout sessions. Um, please find all of our panelists and please thank uh, all of them with me for a great conversation. Thank you.